All right, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My name is Holly Block, Assistant Director for Recruitment at the college, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'd like to introduce the professors who are with us. We have the chair, Vadim Oganesyan, and also Professor Irving Robbins, both from the Department of Physics and Astronomy tonight. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us, professors. Thank you. Hi. I want to introduce the recruitment team as well. So we have Tamara Mosley, admissions advisor recruiter, also Chevy Abraham and Joyce Adorno, all alums of the college, all admissions advisors, recruiters. They're going to work the chat room. So if you have any questions, you can just answer via the chat and then we'll open it up to verbal Q&A after the PowerPoint is concluded. We'd like to get started right away. So Dr. Oganesyan is going to start with his PowerPoint. So the way I was thinking of organizing this is by just sort of saying hello. This is a picture of me probably 10 years ago when I first joined CSI. Um, one of the things I thought of mentioning is that the way physicists think about physics is that it's a unique science that tries to connect all parts of the universe with it, some kind of understanding. Um, there are experiments to be done to be sure that we understand what we think we understand. And sometimes when we can't do experiments, we rely on our friendly astronomers to observe things. And I'm a theorist, so I'm, I'm biased. You know, I generally think that the, the stories that we tell to students are usually stories that come out from theorists, if they're storytellers. Anyhow, uh, you might get a different story from an experimentalist. So I think one of the most um, remarkable things that you notice when you are asked to prepare a presentation about your field, especially about what it's like being in the field, is just how many of the people with physics education leave physics and do useful things elsewhere. I think a lot of people, so if you're an engineer, you get specialized education. Both of my parents are engineers. You know, and when I went to college, I mostly went to physics because I liked physics, I liked math, but I also was quite unclear about what I wanted to do with myself. I think that's sort of more typical than an exception in physics, and so I just picked random people that came to mind that had a physics training that ended up being in biology, being a financier and a, a sort of a, a spaceman, or uh, David X. Cohen is a writer for um, a cartoon, Futurama, that maybe some people remember. Um, so ideas and discoveries in physics are, in some sense, central to everything we do. At CSI, there are many, many, in, in the spirit of giving people with diverse interests, different ways of pursuing uh, their education. We have a straight up physics major, regular four year bachelor degree. We have a minor in physics. We have a double major of engineering and math. So there are different options for you guys. Um, so oftentimes, especially at CUNY, people are worried about, you know, what am I going to do after four years? Am I going to make a living? So just as with many technical fields, there's pretty good evidence, at least historically, that coming out with a STEM degree is uh, generally not a, a loss of four years of training. So this is just uh, the breakdown between private sector and uh, other ways to get employed. Within the private sector, you can start seeing this sort of a pattern that uh, I already alluded to, that most people do not end up going into physics. Yeah, that's only just 5%. Everybody else sort of goes all over the map. There's a little chart of how much money you make. You know, so physicists make money on par with engineers and mathematicians. You know, if you say your parents or your peers want to know, there's a lot of information on what kind of careers uh, one can commence with a physics degree. And there's information about incomes, local companies that employ physicists. So I have a question about this uh, physics and neuroscience. Do they connect? On different levels, neuroscience is a very broad field. I don't know a lot about neuroscience, but I have friends and colleagues who work in neuroscience. So there's different kinds of neuroscience. There's neuroscience, which is measurement based, where you try to design experiments to actually learn facts about what's happening in your brain. And that mm -hmm. very much relies on uh, technical know-how that you would get from uh, a physics lab, for instance, electronics and whatnot. There are other aspects of neuroscience that would benefit from physics. You know, for example, theoretical modeling of neurons is a big business. And so there are a lot of bio there's a whole branch of physics called biophysics. But, but there are also parts of neuroscience that are much more sort of biology oriented. 
um, and that's not very physics. So, um, you know, we have a generic email which gets forwarded to me and the secretary, physics and astronomy at csi.edu. So if you email me and remind me, I will dig up some reading to further explain this connection. Okay. Okay. One of the things that you notice is that uh, when uh, physicists go somewhere else, they find themselves at an advantage. Uh, one of my classmates went to Silicon Valley and he advanced in a semiconductor company. I had several colleagues who went to Wall Street. I've consulted for a hedge fund myself before taking a position at CSI. I have a friend who's a cheesemaker. You know, you get the sense that if you did well as a physicist and as an undergrad, you tend to not be afraid of difficult problems. And, you know, I went one of these links that I showed on the previous page here. I think the first one um, came from American Physics Society. They actually went in to MCAT statistics and they found how well different majors do on the medical entrance exam to medical schools. And not surprisingly, physicists do really well. There are less than 1% of people who go into medicine, but they tend to ace the exams. That's really impressive. They even do better than mathematicians. Well, you know, physics is very interesting because it's not math. It uses math. If you like the useful parts of math, physicists know as well as mathematicians. The thing that physicists have a leg up on uh, mathematicians is that the application of math to real world problems is something that physicists have to kind of like be able to transition from numbers to what these numbers represent. So I'm not too surprised by that. Now, for the LSAT, physicists are neck-to-neck -neck with mathematicians. The difference is 0.1. <laughs> so I don't know. Look, th these numbers are just uh, flashy. Macaulay has told us that the physics and math majors tend to ace the non-traditional fields. So the exams, for, like the MCAT and the LSAT, they do extremely well. So that still holds right. true today. No, that's consistent, yeah. Look, there's an obvious reason why physics is not the most popular major in our division. It's sort of under the radar. There's no concrete sort of you get a physics degree, this company will employ you. There's a lot of room for initiative. There's a lot of room for students actually deciding what to do with themselves. And it's also difficult, right? This is one of the majors that requires calculus as a bread and butter thing. And I'll come back to that. Um, so th these are sort of pictures of our observatory, which is the baby that Irving Robbins nurtured. Um, my baby, uh, it's my baby. I think there's only one other CUNY that has something even close. So late in college, they had the same telescope, but they don't have an observatory. They put it up on the right. Room. So here's a quick glance. I already mentioned calculus. So um, there's a different approach to college education in different departments. I think some departments are very regimented, especially the ones that have accreditation. They have national agencies certifying their degrees, for example, engineering. You don't have a lot of wiggle room to take different courses. In math and physics, it's much more flexible. So in physics, there's a pretty straightforward thing to remember. There's a first year making sure that you got calculus under your belt and introductory physics. That's a first year, first ideal year. Many students come in with not, you know, not being ready to take calculus. So we have ways of bringing them up to speed. It takes one or two semesters, maybe summer school, maybe winter term, you know, different ways of fixing it. But over the years, we've worked it out that it is possible to not, not jump straight into calculus, but still graduate in four years. It would be work for a student. It would, it's work for uh, an advisor to figure out how to stack everything up properly, but it's possible. Then once the first year is out of the way, there is a uh, clutch of upper division courses. So there is classical and quantum mechanics, uh, thermodynamics and statistical physics, electricity and magnetism, maybe a couple more things I'm forgetting. You can look in the catalog. And I would say the really important and the core of what you know, what you do later are these electives, and, and there's, there's lots of them. And electives come and go. Sometimes we uh, suggest to students that they take an elective that's actually from the math department. There are engineering courses that are interesting. I'm actually co-teaching a course, which is an applied physics course this semester called Nanotech Introduction to Nanotechnology, uh, which started as an engineering course, but it's, it's always been run by physicists. Anyway, and there's also other general education courses, English and humanities and whatnot else. Again, you will get uh, uh, the fuller picture once it's time. Now, to bring it closer to conclusion, I think CSI's physics department is small. It's also a young department. The department is only two years old. 
we used to be part of the engineering department. And so there are still very close ties between us and the engineering program. Certainly many of the required engineering courses are taught by physics faculty. Some of them are also taken as electives. So, you, you know, as a physics major, you will be mingling a lot with engineers. You will also be, be mingling with math majors. A lot of our majors are double majors in that. There is a sort of under the radar uh, major called Physics 712 Bachelors in Science. And this is sort of a degree track with the education department. And it's, a, it's kind of an intense track uh, where you are able to get the certification to teach right away. So if you're interested in teaching, high school teaching, um, they provide uh, job placement, they, they take care of you. But it's, it's a tough track because you don't just take physics, you also take education courses and you do practice teaching whilst you're a student also. There, there are strong ties with engineering uh, that I already mentioned, but there are also several faculty in the math and the chemistry departments uh, that have physics PhDs, they're physicists by training, and so we naturally have close ties with them. We work together on research projects, supervision of students, and things like that. So this is sort of a, a bird's eye view of the department. There are a couple of people who are doing experiments. These are Anshul Gorohovsky and Alexander Zaitsev. There are theorists um, who are Anatoly Kuklov, myself, and Saran Gopalakrishnan. And Lee Gay also is a theorist in nanophotonics. Um, so he's a bit you know, in a different area from us, but you know, it's all part of theoretical condensed matter physics. In other words, physics of light, physics of solids, electrons. Uh, William Schreiber is an older colleague who um, uh, has done research in quantum physics, but he's primarily interested in teaching. Um, so astrophysicists or astronomers or astrophysicists, uh, Charles Liu, who's on the sabbatical, Irving Robbins is on the call. And so I don't know what Irv is up into these days. He used to be on the media watch. Yeah, they, yeah, still? Okay. Media watch. And here are the faculty in other departments that I mentioned that have strong physics interests and backgrounds. There are several in the Department of Mathematics. There are two two in the Department of Chemistry, and among the engineers, the ones that I've had closest interactions are listed here. And again, this is just to give you a sense of, as a department, we're quite small, and as a student, it, it's generally considered to be beneficial to be part of a bigger department, I would say, but there's a bigger establishment of physicists on campus. So photonics is what became of optics in the modern age. Optics used to be a science of lenses, prisms, lights, telescopes. As things got miniaturized, light was used in place of electronic interconnectors. You might think that light is kind of like the oldest thing that people studied. In some sense, it's the most sort of actively researched area nowadays, in part because of applications. And so Lee and people like him are working on the interface between theoretical sort of modeling of light, but also being very close to applications. Um, and he's probably the most active as far as mentoring undergrads and graduate students. That's why I put his name first. So Anatoly Kuklov is, uh, uh, does uh, numerical simulations. Again, if you're an undergrad and you're looking for a project, learning how to do numerical simulations is really, really useful. And so I think all of us do some kind of numerical simulations, in part because it makes it very easy to find projects for undergrads. There's all these interesting things to do. The other person that I decided to put here, because he just sent me this picture, this is some of his most recent work, is Alexander Zaitsev. One of his expertise is making uh, synthetic diamonds. Turns out if you grind diamond into different sort of uh, micro powders, you get markers that can be used in biological experiments. Finally, our tech team of astronomers so in the observatory again. Charles, as you know, he's really an expert on galaxies and star formation. And I personally, for many years, have been tracking asteroids. Not Meteor shower usually means if you want to go down to the beach and there's these meteor showers that come in different times of the year, they're very nice. You sit with a cup of hot chocolate all night and you watch the sky aglow with meteors running across the sky, which are just little particles that enter the atmosphere. The ones I hunt, if they enter the atmosphere, these are dangerous asteroids. And I'm part of an international group. And the observatory actually for a long time was one of the first to do this. And we were at the International Astronomical Union, which gives the blessing that you're an official observatory, gave us the blessing back in the 90s. Very few people were hunting asteroids in those days. But now it's such a hot topic that so many people around the world are doing it. And I still do it. But what I do is I actually use telescopes in, in Australia or Spain or 
over in Chile to find, to get my data, because this telescope is too small now to do that. But it's great for showing people the heavens, because you still, because even though it's New York City, you can still see a lot of cool things. Charles is holding a model of Mars in his left hand, and he's holding a model of the moon in his right hand. It looks egg-shaped from my angle. Hey, it's good physics, Vadim. Even the Earth is a little egg-shaped because we spin. And because we spin, the equatorial regions bulge a little bit. Not the moon. The moon is pretty round. It doesn't spin much. Okay. Well, that brings me to the end. There are many more things I could have talked about. You know, we have, if you're interested in computations, you know, doing numerical analysis, we have a high-performance computing center. And as I already mentioned, several of us are heavily involved in numerical computations, numerical modeling. We have a physics club and various national societies that you know students belong to. We um, could talk about students who went on to grad school and how that works out. But I think it's best to see if there are questions. Uh, I wanted to find out how easy it is if, say, you want to go on for your PhD in physics. Right. It's, um, there's a track, there is a deadline. I think uh, graduate schools have a deadline of January 15th for applications. Or, I mean, it, it varies a little bit. There's early admissions, whatever, but generally think of it as mid-year sort of a deadline. There is a hard deadline for all graduate schools to offer admission, and students have a hard deadline of April 15th across the country to decide what, what they do. Now, of course, this is sort of a three steps beyond what you asked. You asked, well, how hard is it to you know, get it? So, so I think the, the process starts now in the sense, you know, once you start, you want to ask yourself, what courses do I want to take so that when I go to graduate school, I'm not going to spend my years in graduate school filling in the gaps in my education. So th there's, you know, the courses that I listed are, should be sufficient to prepare a student for graduate school. So graduate school, th there are GREs, right? So I think the standard GRE, which is English and, um, and math, are required by all graduate schools. There's a subject GRE, which is not required of all graduate schools, but graduate schools like to look at that. So that subject GRE could be very difficult if you didn't study well. And, um, but beyond that, I think the killer in for uh, getting into a graduate school is doing undergraduate research, doing well. Um, if you get a paper published as an undergrad, that usually will get you admitted to have decent graduate schools. The not so secret secret is that the person you would do your research with will write recommendation letters and these recommendation letters are gold. When I sit on the admissions committee and I get somebody's letter who says that this person did this, this and that, and I start reading about the research, it's like, oh, okay, this is actually interesting, okay? The purpose of graduate school is not just to take classes. The purpose of graduate school is to do research. And if somebody can tell that the undergrad already had a taste of research and they know how to hack it, uh, you know, no complaints. It's not rocket science to get into grad school, I would say, if you do well. I mean, I got into grad school without doing research, but these were the old days where the students were kind of expected to just be, have good grades and show interest. I think nowadays, a lot of students who go to grad school are expected to do research. Thank you. I have a question. On average, how many students do you get for each incoming class? Uh, I'll tell you what I know. The time when students declare their major is unpredictable. If we look at the number of physics students that just show up, that number can fluctuate by 50%. You know, So when I first joined CUNY, that number was eight, and it went up to now it's 35, 40. I mean, it just, you, know, you can plot it. I mean, I actually went in and I plotted this number at some point. But the interesting thing, it just can go up and down by a factor of 10 within the semester. And we've always wondered about what causes that. I think the maximum we've ever had was 50. So you get like about 50 students graduating with? Um, no, not physics? 50, right. So that's one number. If I just look and see in the system how big is the class. There's another number of how many students do we graduate. The number of students that we actually graduate tends to be about three to four. Three to year. four students? Per year. And what about those who have physics as a minor? Probably one or two. I mean, we have a few minors. Often they don't walk through our department. So the interesting category that's actually a big category are double majors with engineering because there is a significant overlap between uh, the two requirements. And because, again, a lot of physics uh, faculty teach engineering courses, 
these courses often interchangeable. But I think it was six or seven last year. Physics majors, half of them were double majors. You would say like three or four of your physics majors are double majors? Yeah. Okay. Oftentimes in physics, when I don't know for a fact, like right now I don't have that number, it feels like half is the right ballpark. So I would say that half of our majors are pure physics majors, half of our majors are double majors, a couple of minors. I wanted to make a quick comment. A lot of our professors teach at the Graduate Center. We've got the most out of any CUNY that teach at the CUNY Graduate Center. If your professor happens to teach at the Graduate Center, that means that they're renowned in their field and also they're considered the utmost experts in the industry. The graduate programs in math, physics, chemistry, and biology and biochemistry are at the Graduate Center. The graduate engineering program is entirely housed at City College. Gotcha. So the, the, the engineering program uh, moved from the Graduate Center maybe 15 years ago. It moved to City College. Okay. But the Graduate Center is one part of CUNY that has the PhD program. CSI does not have its own PhD program. Instead, various colleagues from departments, they become members of the Graduate Center to be able to supervise PhD research. The other thing I noticed, you know, if you take a look at the physics catalog, all the course requirements, it seems to me that it's a lot less rigorous than engineering because it's only 120 credits to complete the major. If you're good in math and you can get through calculus one to three, and it looks like the physics core requirements are survivable and doable. So, I mean, it looks like a fantastic program that's survivable. And you're studying things like nuclear and high energy physics condensed matter physics, nanotechnology, and uh, photonics, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. I looked at the type of research that you do, and you had done this with co-researchers from places like Stanford and Princeton. So you work side by side with these renowned professors as well. And I thought this was fantastic, and it's like our best kept secret. I don't keep it a secret, just not many people are asking. (laughs) You know, modern science is very international and distributed, and there's a sly reason for why I did not talk too much about what physicists do in physics. So I'm one of the few physicists who stayed in physics and managed to get to what people of two or three generations ago just generally thought of as the career track, the career track for a physicist to get a bachelor's, get a PhD. There's a period of of a physicist's career called postdoctoral work, where you have uh, appointments that are a finite term, or two two years, and that's when you hunker down and you do some of your best work. You focus, and you know you have a limited amount of time, so you have no time to waste. And then you try to get a uh, faculty job or a job at a national institution. Trouble is that uh, the number of such jobs is has always been small. It's been dwindling, and so if you have too many people who are looking for these jobs, it becomes easier to hire. The point is that if you really want to do physics, you better be super duper outstanding and, and lucky, right? It's not just being good. And so the, because of this, um, if you look around CUNY, which, you know, at least when I joined CUNY, research was not a strong point. But I think over the past 10 years, not just CSI, but the entire CUNY has been transformed in part because there were enough good people who recognized that, hey, we're in New York City, we can hire top-notch people. Because Stanford cannot hire them all, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I have this discussion with uh, our graduates uh, because uh, a lot of them have families who, just like my family, they pressure them, okay, we, we don't want uncertainty. Go get a job that pays a lot of money. I immigrated to the U.S. and I went to college a year after. Both, but my parents were kind of hands-off, but they were gentle, but still, you know, they let me do whatever I wanted to. But there are students that I've come across at CSI who are very mindful of how they can support their families. Yeah, my parents did not need my support, but, you know, that could be different for different people. And so the decision to go into graduate school and try to become a professional physicist is a risky one. Okay. And we can have this conversation in three years. Sometimes risk it's worth risking, right? And, you know, what you're risking is your time, right? You're risking that in six years of grow, five years of graduate school, you might decide that this is not for you. And I, I can be honest with you that I wasn't sure five years into graduate school if this was for me. And then I got a good job. I got a postdoctoral position at Princeton. I said, oh, okay, if Princeton is calling, I can, who am I to say no? <laughs> right. And kind of yeah, but but at every step of the uh, of the way, I you know I had to be honest with myself that this is a an upward climb. 
So you're taking um, any physics now? No, I didn't get a chance to take f- physics, but I'm taking pre-calculus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Also psychology. Yeah. I, I understand your question about neuroscience then, that you're exposed to those ideas. Um, I'm curious, why did you express interest in physics? I'm more interested in the quantum mechanics and astrophysics. I can tell you that it was in middle school when I stopped reading science fiction uh, uh, books and started asking, well, I want to go into space. I want to build my own spaceship. And at that point, I realized that unless I figure something out myself, nobody's going to build a spaceship for me that can go to the stars. (laughs) And so I made that decision when I was in middle school and I stopped thinking about it. So I just want to say... We don't have exactly an astrophysics degree, but within the physics degree, there are a number of different courses you can take, which really are designed to prepare you for graduate work in astrophysics. So we've had a few students do that. They take a physics degree. Right now, for example, I'm teaching three students a senior level astrophysics course online. It's sort of fun for me. I haven't done it many years and I'm enjoying it. And that's a good preparation. Uh, so with the basic physics degree, with fundamental courses in electricity, magnetism, quantum mechanics, it's a good background now to step into a master's degree or a PhD program. And especially if you have under your belt some astrophysics courses, which talk about the evolution of stars and uh, how do we measure them, and also galaxies and good stuff like that, and cosmological models. It's a good idea to have a background when you step in. So we try to prepare people who are interested. But if you take those classes, uh, it's not essential you take the classes, but it's very helpful in stepping into a graduate program. And I would recommend if you're going to go into astrophysics, you go all the way, PhD. I know it's a lot of work. It's I also wanted more. to add, you get fantastic one-on-one attention in the physics and astronomy program because as Dr. Oganesian explained, it's a small group. So you will get the utmost attention and one-on-one mentorship. Of course, they can research the asteroid discovery through the astrophysical observatory. What are some other... Uh, we, don't, we don't do that anymore because like I said, I use telescopes around the world now. The situation is how deep can you penetrate into space? Now, we've always had light pollution in New York. Yes. And some people actually wondered, did you see something? And the answer is yes, we did see very well actually. For many years, the largest telescope in the world was called the Mount Palomar Telescope. It had a mirror that was 200 inches. In fact, Corning Glass upstate New York is very interesting. But in any event, in terms of the depth that they went with taking a picture, they used photography with film. And they got out to really deep magnitudes. We rate them the higher the number, the deeper in space you can go. Their magnitude level was 17. CSI Observatory immediately got the 17. Why? Because, number one, we had the new charge coupled device cameras and these were very sensitive they cooled down to minus 40 degrees and that 16 inch telescope grabs a lot of light and we were able to equivalent to the mount palomar observatory in fact we even went a little deeper we went to 18th magnitude all right but that's still no good today in order to in order to do work in asteroid work you got to go to the 21st 22nd magnitude so you have to have telescopes in mountains exotic places and that's why i'm part of a telescope group that uh, we pay a fee, right? and then we have the option to get in there, order some pictures. Like most astrophysics today and astronomy is done that way. And but in fact, there's a very thin distinction between what is an astronomer today and what's an astrophysicist. Most astronomers are really astrophysicists. Let me ask you a question, Irving. Yes. Uh, is this something that you have involved undergrads in? Yes, absolutely. I did a lot of different types of research with physics and engineering students and math students and chem students at the observatory. A huge list of different things that I used to do with them. But we had big giant radio telescopes that we did work with, satellite tracking. We had a lot of fun in that observatory over the years. So let me start with astrophysics. So Irving Robbins and Charles Liu are two astrophysicists, and uh, Charles has published almost all of his recent papers with graduates. I think a lot of modern astronomy is analyzing information that comes from somewhere else. You know, I I know graduate students uh, travel to beautiful places like Arizona and whatnot. I don't know if undergraduate students do that. Charles works with the Museum of Natural History, the the astrophysics department there, and he brings his students in there as part of the research. So that's a really good experience because then you're immersed in, in a very active group. 
So there's theoretical research that undergraduates have been engaged in, and that more often than not, that starts as computer modeling of something interesting. So in our department, that would be me, uh, Tolly Kukloff, Saranga Palakrishnan, and or Lee Gay. I want to emphasize that the opportunities to do undergraduate research, and I would think that that's probably the most important, like, especially for somebody who is interested in doing something that's not just classwork. I, I think doing research is really the, mo- the only reason to get, get proper training, <laughs> because then, then you kind of understand um, something new, something that nobody else has studied. In my experience, at least, oftentimes when undergraduates come to you for a project, it's just risky to give them a truly difficult thing. You don't want them to get demoralized, but um, studying phenomena on a computer is, you know, could be fun. Right? You, you get to experience things firsthand. You get to play nature. I think the short answer is that it works out differently. There's enough people interested in doing research that I wouldn't worry for an undergraduate's a research project. It does start getting tricky when we cannot meet in person. So I have a, an independent study, sort of an undergraduate research project now. The students seem very able. We've been Zooming every couple of weeks. I'm not sure how well it's going. I mean, he seems to be getting things done, but it's, it's, it's just different. <laughs> you know, it's different by, you know, my graduate students are in the same boat. Right? We have meetings. Um, there's a question um, that I think high school students should be asking, what is going to happen? I think by default, we want to be flexible to take advantage of people like Irving who have years and years of expertise. You know, I had to uh, endure two and a half meetings this morning with the college presidents. I think the general understanding is that we have to be ready for anything. But most importantly, students should be aware that they will get the best that we can give under the circumstances. The physics department is actually in okay shape as far as being online. I have a question. Which year am I getting a major, like, in general? You could declare your major as early as you know that's what you want to do. So you could do that when you come in as a freshman. You could come in as a physics major or biology major. In biology, we do have a concentration in neuroscience if you like, where you could do that and minor in physics, or you double major with biology, concentration in neuroscience, and physics as your dual major. That's if you know exactly what you want to study. If not, you could do the undecided health science or just regular undecided. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but the majority of our students do not declare major right away, and I wish they would, because oftentimes you run into cases where students are told to take certain courses not by the uh, advisors from the department, but by advisors from outside the department who may not fully understand how to uh, line up the uh, coursework, you know, because that's a risk basically for taking the wrong classes and not graduating on time. The sooner you declare, basically, and, you know, you should be on it. If you're not sure, you're not sure. But also one um, advice that I've heard given, I haven't given it, but basically if you have the, nowadays by looking at the catalog and maybe asking questions, feel free to ask uh, departmental advisors, if you can figure out which majors are more uh, regimented, stringent, and which ones are more flexible. For example, the math major is even more flexible than physics. In math, you can t- there are very few required courses and everything is an elective. So one of the advices that I've heard is that look at the major that is the most regimented, that tells you exactly what to take. You declare that major, you go with that. If you want to switch out of that major, it's okay. The other majors will be forgiving. If you know other students in your boat who haven't made it to these info sessions and they have questions or they're undecided, it's better that they don't wait for another info. You know, if they want to contact us and uh, directly, and you know, the email for physics is straightforward. If there are questions, if they if they need uh, advice or um, clarification, yes, we will we will refer any questions about physics directly to you. Okay. It's generally recommended if you know what you want to study to go to that department and speak to that department's advisor instead of going to a general advisement. Even if you are not 100% sure, but you know like, hey, I'm interested in physics, I'm interested in engineering, best to go straight to the department and speak to those faculty members and the advisors than to go for a general advisement. Because the faculty who actually teaches the class and it's more likely to steer you in the right direction than someone like me. <laughs> hey, I'm going to bid you all good night. Nice seeing you. Thank you so much, Irving. Thank you. It was nice to meet you. Good night. Thank you for good being night. with us. Thank you so much, Fadim. I think it was uh, very enlightening. Right. I learned a lot just listening to everyone. Have a good one. William, thank you for being with us tonight. All right.
All Take right, care. everyone. Have a good evening. Hopefully, we'll get to see you, and uh, you'll join us in the fall. Take care. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.